you know, I think of, and maybe this is just situation. This is not situational. I think this is just the life we all we see this in life, where I can I can run into a seventy two or seventy three year old, and they're kind of that that's it. They're old. They're they're kind of like they 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 strike me as old, and then I run into to my new neighbor, and we talk for twenty minutes or so, real friendly, and it, it just like he's young. And he and he, when he told me his age, he's like, oh, I'm 78. So you've got a super young 78 year old, and then we all know people that are 72 or 74, and they and they don't feel young. And I think we all see that. What just what I know this is an impossible question to answer because there's so many layers to this. What is it? Is it genetics? Is it is the the the, the young one is regularly been exercising since they were 30? Is it their diet? Is it physical? Is it mental? I mean, that's like the, the the whole question around longevity in one question. But I wanted to maybe think about it in that context. Young people who, yeah. Yeah. There are dumbling people you meet and you just, they just have, I, I think what most people respond to when they meet someone that is older than they expect. Like they're, how could you be that, that age? That's not what I envisioned for 78. Uh, I think of someone who's, you know, not going to be moving very quickly or um, maybe not interesting. I think that, so, so I will say that a part of this is just uh, our interpretation of what age looks like. And uh, we're pretty ageist as a society where we think about old people and getting older and it's like becoming irrelevant and useless and not relevant to our worlds when we're younger. And so part of it is we have this sort of stereotype in our head about what it's like, but at the same time, we definitely meet these people that seem, I'll say prematurely older yeah. than you would expect. And that really stands out. And you're, I mean, it's always funny when people say, Oh, the golden girls, you know, when I was growing up, were like the old ladies that were like kind of the fun old lady. They were in their fifties. The golden right? girls were in their fifties. Um, yeah. They were in their like upper fifties. <laughs> And maybe early 60s, I mean, depending on which season you're in. But yeah, they were in their 50s and it's like, but you don't think about old as in your 50s anymore. That sounds silly and ridiculous. But there are definitely these people who are, we'll say, like you said, 72. And you're thinking, okay, when I'm 72, I definitely want to be a person who is not working and enjoying uh -huh. my time. I want to be that person who's got all the time in the world to to work on hobbies, to to take my time checking out of the grocery store instead of hurrying to get stuff done. Like really have the space to breathe. By the way, I love the grocery store. That's like an event for me. If, when I, if I ever get to the grocery store, my wife will call. She's like, where are you? I'm still, I'm, and I'll say, I'm, I, the other day I said, I'm shopping. She was like, what, for what, for what? I was like, I, I'm at the grocery store. She was like, she said, that's not shopping. That's grocery shopping. She, when you say shopping, you're like buying like, jeans but i was like okay i'm gro i'm sorry i'm grocery shopping i'm sorry keep going yeah well the grocery store is a fascinating if you're a sociologist like me the grocery store is like a microcosm of fascinating human interactions and there's all kinds of stuff you see and when you talk about old people they shop at different times than people of different ages so if you're curious to go watch um, people of different ages you go to the grocery store at a particular time and and this has been the case for a long time for lots lots of different reasons. But when you when you see someone who's like older than you expect at a grocery store, what you see is they're leaning on their yeah. cart for yep. support. They're walking more slowly. Their steps are more shuffles than steps. These are about mobility, usually, right? The physical mobility. And there's a lot of factors that influence our physical mobility as we age. But it's really correlated with a lot. And I think when we look at someone who's not able to move quickly when they walk, that's a sign that they're becoming frail and struggling. And by the way, those things connect to your brain. Frailty with your body mm. leads to cognitive consequences. So then you often see this connection with speaking more slowly sometimes. Um, they can be related, but aren't always. So there is this sort of, I'll say, accelerated aging some people have. And then the alternative which are these like super angers where it's like they're 90 and they're running marathons and doing all the things that you don't expect of a 90 year old. Um, and most people don't live right. like that. Um, so there are genetic aspects sure. to this. Um, I just lost my aunt in that last month. She was 92, smoked for over 70 years. 
Um, she never ate vegetables or fruits. Uh, she didn't. She broke all the longevity rules, and she was fine. Her brain was fine. She was sharp as a whip, and um, and and I don't know why she survived as long as she did. She finally got lung cancer and and died very rapidly with very little, you know, suffering. I mean, she is like the example of of all the good things. We, we wouldn't look at her life and say, well, everyone should smoke for 70 years and eat bacon multiple times a week and avoid <laughs> fruits and vegetables. We know better than that. So there's genes that are protective and some people are just born with that um, in front of them, both good and bad, you know? By the way, what have we, I know that there's, and I don't know if this is maybe part of your research or not. How, is it just been so difficult to identify? Like, so take your aunt, that example you hear about once in a while, Perhaps. smoked for 50, 70 years, but still lived into the 90s. Is there is there nothing genetically that we can figure out about that person that we can somehow replicate? Is the in the longevity industry, I would think, has tried to work on that and learn from, I don't know, sea turtles that live indefinitely? What, what Where are we... <laughs> Right. The negative yeah. salinity, isn't it called something like negative salinity where you don't, your cells don't age? Why have we not been able to figure that yeah. out? Why is there no magic potion at all? The problem is there's lots of stuff going on all at the mm. same time. So any one thing, it just doesn't exist. That's why there, there's never going to be a pill you take and it's like the longevity pill. And you could just take that pill and you, you'd reduce, you know, you slow down Damn it. or something. Are like that. Are you sure I mean, about that? Everybody we have wants AI that. now. I, I, <laughs> I know. It, maybe maybe there's something coming. Maybe AI will help us find the yeah. magic pill, but I don't think that's ever likely to happen. The issue is there's a whole bunch of factors that are going on. And you might think of it as you have a genetic capacity to live a certain length. And the lifestyles we have either reduce that capacity or help you reach that yeah. capacity. And we don't ever know because we, we just don't have enough information or insights about your genetic capacity. But we we have the you know, if we're born in environments that aren't very supportive and we have a rough childhood, that's going to reduce, you know, our capacity. Um, on the other hand, if we have all the resources we need growing up, that might help us reach that capacity. So my aunt probably should have lived to be 105 and, you know, she gave up some years. That makes right? sense. Like we might think yeah. of it that way. Let's start with, so first of all, what do we get, what do we get wrong about, and I want to come back to mobility because I think you answered, that's an interesting way to look at this is that there, this mobility, you slow down in pace and movement and you slow down cognitively kind of all at the same time. And that's what we, we see as age. It's like, oh, that person is slower. And, uh, but what do we get, what do we, what's the biggest thing we get wrong about, about aging? Well, first of all, probably the thing we get wrong is that it's all bad. Mm. I mean, I, I mean, let's start there. Um, getting older, I mean, you, you, sh most people as they get older, they feel more free and they feel more connected with themselves. That's the right thing. That's part of development. As we get older, we have this amazing opportunity to better make sense of things that maybe we weren't able to handle when we were younger. You, you, you have experience to draw from. And they always say, like, don't sweat the small stuff. It's so trite. But it's, you know, as you get older, you actually mm -hmm. don't sweat the small because you have perspective. You look backwards and you say, I've been through these hard things before. I mean, unless you're like some rare individual that had no hard things happen to you. And, uh, <laughs> wow. Well, I don't, I don't no, know if there's many, of, many people, of them. But, there, I mean, there's some, but you're but, right. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. And, and I will say there's, there's something to be said for having had too many bad things happen to you that, doesn't work well but for most people um the the benefits of aging are that you you have more ability to see with clear eyes what really matters and you're able to highlight and focus your time and attention on those things and and from my perspective um most well i'd say most conversations i have the thing people think are most important are having having lots of money and maybe fame when they're young they and and those are the least important things as yeah. you get older. Now, being poor is bad, but being super rich isn't as important as having right. enough. And so once you have enough, that's, that's enough. enough. Um, but if you have no friends and you have enough money, that's way worse than being poor and having lots of friends. If I were to give up one of those things, it's the people in our lives 
that that matter the most um, that give us meaning and purpose. So is it the meaning and the purpose that okay? So so we we I love this idea of perspective, mobility, perspective, and then socialization. So clearly that is there's a there's a link. Why I, I think about Dan Butner and his, his work around the. Uh, you know, longevity in, around the world. And one of the cultures, I think it's the, it, the the Okinawan culture where women have these moas where they live to, they kind of pledge and they live their friends forever. It's like a golf group plus one uh, forever. What What is it that, why do we, does it just change us psychologically? Does it keep us healthy so psychologically? How does it help longevity does it give us purpose? Yeah. T- tell me of why it works or what does it do? Yeah. Well, I mean, you can be really simple. If you're, if you're sitting in your bed and you're dying and you're thinking back on your life, it's, it becomes really crystal, crystal clear to say, what am I leaving the world with in my absence? And usually the thing you want to leave the world with are the people and the things that the connections that you made and you left behind. And I think it's that simple, but let's go further because socialization is also about doing things. You're building ideas, you're building solutions, you're helping make one person's or two person's or many people's lives better um, in some way if you're really having an impact Um, and you're able to see those benefits through those people. But when you meet with people, you're also physically doing things. Um, if you go out and spend time with friends, um, especially in these blue zones and other places, you see these connections. They're, they're usually doing yeah. something. They're physically moving and they're using their brains. And um, when you talk about longevity, I always say, like, it's kind of simple. You want to make sure you're physically, socially, and cognitively active. And when you're connecting with people in meaningful ways, you're often doing all three at the same time. Because the reality is we need to exercise, but more isn't always better. More is enough. Like you reach a point where enough, there's enough. We don't know what the enough is yet, by the way, and it probably varies per person. But but there's a point at which you, you don't have as much return on investment with certain things. And with, with exercise, Doing nothing is really bad, but doing even a small amount gives you lots of gains and exercise has remarkable impacts on everything else. But you wouldn't want to exercise 10 hours a day. That would hurt you. Um, but when it comes to social engagement, um, there's there's a really great set, uh, body of literature on volunteering. And I think it's actually the best form of social engagement um, for really studying because these aren't people who are just like friends of yours or family members you have to be around. These are strangers you choose to be around and you're, you have an explicit purpose to connect and give back. Um, and when it comes to volunteering, you pretty much max out the benefits to health of any other health activity you can get if you're just volunteering two to three hours a week, mm. which isn't that yeah. much. But but the health returns in later life are as good as any any health behavior I can get my hands on, and and I think that's fascinating. It is fascinating. So it's uh, it, when I talk. So one of the things we uh, one of the primary pillars of a happy retiree is something called what we call core pursuits. I call these hobbies on steroids. At, on average, they have three point six. Caught four core pursuits. The number one one it for the happy retiree group versus the unhappy came back in our research was volunteering. What I didn't, what I didn't ever dig down on and that what I'm asking you about is, uh, I, so first of all, the, the amount of time, which you, you've already just kind of answered, is it, is it a, just a lifelong, it's like you're, you, you're currently volunteering or did you also say that it's almost like, exercise, if you're doing it in your forties, it's like it builds up over time and what, what kind of volunteering, or does that not really matter just to be some sort of volunteer? So maybe just explore volunteering. Yeah, sure. I'll talk to you about that. So, um, there's not as much information on the type of volunteering that you're doing, but we're going to talk, but, but most of the science of volunteering and health outcomes are related to what we call formal volunteering. This isn't going and making a pie for your neighbor. This is working for an organization that has a mission um, and it has 
it leverages volunteer labor for a particular um, outcome that is about serving others in some way. So it can be a lot of different things, but you know, it, it can, it, the most common kinds of activities, um, are usually working for a formal organization and, and giving your time to like work at a hospital and, you know, um, help with the activities around the hospital or, uh, working often t times with children or something like that's tutoring. Okay. Yep. So this either church, one of those examples, I, I think uh, what, what comes stuff. to my church to me, comes to mind. A yeah. lot of church, like churches facilitate volunteering. So for example, like I, I, when I was a teenager, we at church, we would uh, go do like build houses for um, Habitat for Humanity and things like that. I work at um, food pantries and, and help uh, support the community. And in those situations too, there's, there's physical activity involved and there's social engagement with others with a shared mission and purpose. And it reinforces your identity as the kind of person that supports others. It helps you build empathy which makes you feel like you matter and it helps you feel good. And there's some growing evidence that there's physiological changes within your body when you help other people, because you, you can sort of think about bad stress makes you feel inflamed or gives you inflammation within your system. Good activities need sort of helping activities sort of like decrease that so that when you're faced with stress, your body doesn't react. You're, you have um, the capacity to stop the bad stress reactions from occurring. And that's sort of what we're seeing in a physiological S similar way. To is, is similar to exercise? Similar to exercise, yeah. Probably the mechanisms are different because exercise is about blood flow to certain parts of throughout, throughout your body. Um, and But there's still certainly some movement here. Usually when you're volunteering, you're walking a lot more than you would. You know, you're certainly not sitting and watching television, which is the kiss of death for yeah. longevity, right? There's nothing that is is probably worse for your health. Is do you, would you consider that like yeah. one of the one of the worst things? Everybody argues with me about this one. I, I'm I'm I believe there's a place for TV, just not as a primary replacement for work. You retire and you sit down and watch TV during the hours you would be working. That's a good way to die young, in my view, especially since you're not doing anything with others. And you're not physically moving, um, and and it would obviously depend on what you're watching if you're learning something. Um, but yeah, I, I would say avoid TV except for special occasions. View it as a, a treat, not as a primary activity. Um, but you know, volunteering is fascinating because it it tends to be something that is very accessible. There's even some efforts to start finding volunteer activities you can do remotely. Um, and I think that's going to be an exciting opportunity with, with aging. We're not sure if we'll get the same bang for the buck. I think being in the community is better than being on your computer volunteering. But there's this meaningful connection you get, and it helps you with physiology. You, you, you might think about volunteering as something that might help you with your brain to feel happier. That's mm -hmm. easy. You're less lonely. And we know loneliness is, is one of the worst things mm -hmm. for you. Um, might as well pick up smoking if you're going to be lonely, yeah. right? It's the same kind of problem. Uh, well, not exactly, but you know, it's, it's similar kind of dagger. Um, yeah. Negative effect yeah. for your life. Yeah. It's bad. Um, but, but volunteering helps you build connection and so forth. But what's fascinating to me is it's protective of your physical health and your cognitive health. Those, those are things people don't anticipate. And you say, well, how could volunteering help your physical health. So you see these people who are struggling physically. This this is by way of those physiological responses. When we don't have inflammation and st physiological stress responses that come with everyday life and aging, these are, are lower in in people we we hypothesize and, and there's some some growing evidence to support that. Um, and that's why we think we see these physical benefits. You know, I think the other thing, too, about vol volunteering, I think about th through I, I love the, the thought around for formal volunteering is, is a really interesting concept. And, and I think about even at a church that facilitates multiple different maybe they're different ministries and one is food related, one is care related, one is children related. It's not a huge <clears throat> investment in your time if whatever you pick isn't quite right is the other thing around volunteering. It's almost as though I, I, I look at volunteering 
depending on the, 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 the kind of volunteer you're doing is that if it's not working out, there's usually other options to go to kind of relatively qu quickly. It's not it's like you're, you're trapped in a volunteering jo job that you may not like. So I, I do love that. And, oh, and yeah. again, to your point, you, you have done studies around this or there, are you, there's, there have been studies that have shown that there is this physiological benefit from because I've, ne I've never heard that before. And it's fascinating to me. Yeah, some of the work is mine, um, but but I have a colleague that's particularly done some work. We call it biomarkers, where we have like little little bits of biological data, and they can collect that information on your stress response on on a day you volunteer and on a day you don't volunteer, and just that alone shows reduced stress response. Um, and it's just really fascinating to sort of see that. And and there's you know the theory is that you just you know, things just don't bother you as much when you have your eye on the prize. I know, I know that things are fine. I'm connected with a purpose and the small stuff just doesn't affect you in the same way. Okay. Let me ask you this. Uh, how about, do we get in general, on average, do we get that same physiological biomarker reduced stress from our, our work, our primary jobs? And my next question is is a little related to that, which would be, do you see as people age and they stop their primary jobs and they stop working, does stress go down or does life get throw you similar but different kinds of stress? So those are two totally separate questions. So let's so get work versus volunteer. Do we get something similar? Yeah, the bang for the buck, same situation. So if you just look straight up at the averages two hours of work of uh, volunteering and 20 hours of work are about the same in terms of the health benefits. If you account for all the other extraneous factors that would otherwise explain wow. those things, that's just the work we've been doing at a kind of a population level. If it, you know, just as a, as a researcher that studies work in later life, the thing is it really is dependent on the kind of work mm -hmm. that you're doing. If you have, people who are in jobs that are frankly dangerous to your health and we know lots of people do they're not going to benefit from continuing to work they're better off doing something that is out of those environments those of us who have cush jobs like i do sitting in a chair and working on a computer and um you know working with people and thinking all day long that's good for you that's good for me as long as I'm exercising too. So I'm not too sedentary. Boy, that's going to give me benefits of all types. And I'm going to get some of that kind of good feeling stuff because I'm mentoring people and helping others. I'm doing work that has a positive impact on society. Hopefully. So as long as we're not doing dangerous work and when I, at, at first I thought you were going to say it's almost dangerous if you have a sedentary job, but you, you mean literally like if you're working on power lines or, or something like that's danger, yeah. danger, danger. Yeah. But the the benefits of working helping people interacting with other humans that to, to you even though it's like it's not it's 10 times less good than volunteering it's still healthy well that's what that's on average because we're not accounting for those differences so if you were to just look at people who are in jobs where they get to use their brain a lot we sometimes um uh, call it cognitively complex jobs mm. um and these are jobs where you have a lot of autonomy and you have to think creatively and uh, you have uh, engagement with other people on a regular basis. Those people benefit from continuing to work and they maintain cognitive function longer than those who are in jobs that don't do that. Have you ever studied or read any studies about this happens a lot, but I guess I think about this for younger folks. So I think of retire sooner audience. And an extreme example, and again, we're not, our, our, we're trying to help people retire six months sooner, a year sooner, two years sooner, not, not an extreme. Mm -hmm. yep. But if you were to look at extreme cases where you end up with a, you know, I always think of technology where somebody, they end up with, you know, $50 million of, they worked at Netflix or whatever it might be. And then they stop at 40. Uh, and they, do you, if, do you know of, the ramifications around that, or do those people, if they, if it doesn't work for them, they, they end up going back and they continue to work. I, 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 my kids asked me this the other day, Don, they, they were, it was some, 
something on the news about somebody in tech that you know was something about 100 million or five some some giant number right and and i one of my i think my 12 year old asked he why why do they why does that guy keep working why is he why is he still working if he already has X, Y, Z. And I was, and, and I tried to explain it to him, but what would you say to my kid? What would you say to my kid? Well, I would say that for after a certain amount of money, working has nothing to do with making money anymore. Nothing to do it's with about making having money. I love that. a purpose in your life that where you feel like you're having an impact and money is a way that you're rewarded for that. And we have a market value for that work. And that changes depending on what time and history you're living. And um, and how we value things. You know, in the United States, we value certain types of work more than others, and the pay is commensurate with that, as economists would argue anyhow. Um, but most of the time, and especially once you have sufficient money, and there are plenty of people who have enough money to retire, and they don't. And sometimes that's because they're afraid that they're going to end up needing more than they expect. And, and frankly, then they're just, I mean, you might argue, they're just sort of hoarding enough so they don't have fear. And the thing is, you know, retirement is more than just about not working. It's about the time in our life when we're in a new phase where work is not the center of what we're doing. People who have plenty of money um, often want to work in a way that's like volunteering. Mm -hmm. You have a choice in the matter. You know at any point you could walk away. And there is nothing better than having control over that decision. When you're in a job where you know you can't leave because you won't pay your next bill, and you have no control over what time you come and go, that is the worst kind of work in terms of, you know, feeling like you're, I'll say, sort of imprisoned by your desire and need for money. Once you reach a certain point, it's fun. I love what I do. I would do it for free. I would say that. Don't, don't tell, tell my boss Florida that. State. I don't want to actually I won't tell the provost. Free. Yeah. <laughs> don't tell Florida State. Uh, but I'm, I love what I'm doing. And, um, and I, I feel that it, I have so much autonomy and control over that, that the hard work feels like fun work. And so, so few of us, I think, are lucky to have that at younger ages. But if you retire young, most people do go back to right. work. I mean, almost everyone goes back to work and, and they may say, oh, I want to retire and they want to retire as soon as they can. The pattern is within two years, more than half of people go back to work at some amount of time and they love it. They're doing it because they want to. They found an activity that gives them joy. And sometimes it's, I want a little fun money that I can play with and it gives me a little space for that. But often it's it's 20 hours or less and it's stuff that they like to do or they start a business and they get to be like a part-time entrepreneur doing meaningful activities and they're happier than they've ever been in their whole life. Oh, so you actually, so you've seen, you, you've studied this. So you've, it's. Oh yeah. So it's, it's, where, where do I read about yeah. this? I, I want to read about this. 20 hours or. <laughs> well, there's a So concept. you only need 20 yeah, hours well, or less. I mean, you need 20 hours or less. 50% of people go back. Like these are, these are things I need to do. I, I need to do a whole podcast about this. Well, maybe, I don't know. There's, there's a concept that like, it became more common about 2000, right, right around the first dot-com bubble, where um, people started going back to work after they retired. Um, it was less common before because we had pension programs that disincentivized returning to work. But now we have these things we call defined contribution plans, and what that means is lots of people don't contribute enough and they need more money, and they find themselves, especially the boomers, um, you know, since the... 2008 recession, they need more money. And so that's driving part of it. But certainly since then, more than half of people who retire, leave full-time work, come back. And Un retirement. Yeah. The on retirement. And so Nicole Masta, she's a, I, I think she's at Harvard now, but she sort of coined that term on retirement. And, uh, but there's for a lot of years, people would talk about these things called bridge jobs. And it's like your bridge between your career job and your retirement. Um, I don't know if I love that term anymore, but I like this idea of post-retirement work because your brain is retired. I'm doing this because I want to. I'm retired, but I'm choosing to go back to work to do this thing I want to do. And I know at any time I could walk away. Post-retirement work. We, we call it, we call it that, that bridge working is, I, I think of that as kind of the retirement gray zone where 
used to be black and white. Now yeah. it's there's this long gray period of where you're 20. Definitely. I like I like this to define it as 20 hours a week. In general, though, do ret- those of, let's say, more normal, quote, normal retirement age, let's call it mid-60s, do, do you see the lower stress for, for that group on average when they've stopped working? Yeah, it all depends on how you define stress. Um, so your work is different and, and there's sort of this honeymoon period after you leave retirement where I think the first six months are probably where you see it the most, the sort of reduced stress. It's, it's acute, it's immediate. Absolutely. People report higher life satisfaction in those first year or so of retirement, um, because they're just, they're just sort of recovering Mm. from not having a real break for a long time, very often. And, and that's good for everyone. It sort of tells you probably we should structure our lives in a way where we have kind of six-month mm. breaks every seven years or something. And probably we might like our lives a little bit better. Um, most of us don't have the ability to do that. But I suspect it, it's a sign that that would benefit us. I like that um, idea, by the way. But <laughs> that after that six months or a year, a lot of people start getting itchy. Because it turns out routine gives us, again, this sense of why am I here? What am I supposed to do today? And if you have the sense of, I I mean, I I used to say sense of purpose, but there's like, what are your goals for today? And a lot of people that's maybe defined as they're entering. Some people leave work because they have a sick family member and they're caring for them. And that gives them- Some purpose, their their role. role, yeah. Yeah, the sense of like, what's my role in life now? And we we spend so many years as workers defining our role around our accomplishment, or sometimes yeah. parent. Yeah, yeah, it like sets you up. Like, what am I here to do? And if you retire and you don't have any role set up, that that's okay for a little while. But there's a point at which that becomes stressful, actually. So it's a different kind of stress that returns. So when you say is it stressful? Well, maybe you create new structure for your time. Um, but if people don't create sort of a system for what their day and their life and their sense of identity revolves around, they don't do well. So you're, you're saying there is great power behind a routine. It, it really is extraordinarily helpful. Yeah. I mean, you're also talking to someone who hates having someone tell me what I need to do from one day to the next. Um, I don't love routine in that regard, but it is in fact still a routine. I mean, the variation within that range, I get up and I do this, I exercise and I take my kids to school and then I go to work and then I come home and then I make dinner and then I, you know, and I have these sort of things I do and the order in which I do them might change from day to day. But if you take away that big chunk in the middle um, and I don't have kids at home anymore, which I won't, you know, in five years or six years, I'm going to have a different kind of pattern to my day. And that kind of gives gives me kind of the insights about my sense of identity and how I'm giving back in the world um, and to others. And if it's all about myself, people are like, oh, it's I earned this money. I get to choose what I want to do. It's really not that fulfilling to just take care of yourself mm-hmm. all the time. Most of the time that doesn't take us very far. Like meet your needs, sure. Um, but the rest, there usually needs to be something that you're really digging into. I think that's why people go back to work. It's so much easier for them to wrap their head around It's easier to define, these are the families I'm helping, these are the clients I'm helping, uh, and then this is the family member I'm helping. It it worked, you're right. And again, enter volunteering. It's it's very clear who you're helping. I want to talk about socialization. It, It feels to me, you think about, so money, on the scale of, again, needing some sort of f- uh, foundation, eliminating this fear, we're going to run out. That's a pretty big deal, right? It's like a, on a scale one four, to 10, four. it's a it's a 10. But it also gets press and coverage like it's a 12. It, it, it gets all the press, if you think about it. It gets a lot of it. Then you think about socialization, which is a 10, and it gets like a two on the the thought around what are you doing like what are you doing about it there's not there is so little on a relative basis it's not zero on hey this is like a huge deal but what are we doing about it in life that's that is i guess talked about in any sort of structure or like hey you really need to spend x amount of time making sure you are being social forcing yourself to do more socialization cultivating that 
And I, I guess I just, A, wanted your opinion on that, and B, I wanted to talk about men versus women, and then just like the practical steps of c- keeping that cultivation of socialization going. Yeah, those are awesome things to talk about. Um, first of all, I think you're right. When you think about, if you want to talk about a retirement portfolio, I think that's a good way to think about it. You know, you have your money stuff, and then you have your like people stuff your social side and then you have your like sort of daily tasks i mean there's and then like where is exercise fitting in there and it should be and if you're doing those things those meaningful activities those social activities um those physical activities and then you're making sure you have enough money that's your balanced that's a real balanced portfolio in preparation for retirement did you i wrote down three so it's i I like it money people exercise was there one more and and Purpose? tasks, things, your roles, those things yeah. we were just talking about. What is your role for what you're doing in your day? And that could be those other things, of course. Um, but, you know, you could spend time in lots of different ways, but it's about figuring out what your your sort of meaning and, and sort of structure of your day centers around tasks that are meaningful for you. But if we go to socialization, I do feel like what's happened – and I think the pandemic, you know, just like really put the gas on these trends. Um, there hasn't been as much emphasis to social relationships as any of these other things for most of the time. And sometimes people are like, well, I just don't have time for friends because I'm working so much or I have kids at home or all these things. And and the issue is um, you don't suddenly hit retirement and say, okay, now I'm going to get friends. I mean, I'm sure there are people who are like, okay, my task for today is to go get a friend. But it, you know, most of <laughs> we, the time- well, You know what? We've circled right back to the grocery store. I'm going to go shopping. Actually, I love that. It's, it is a good place to go meet a new friend. I like this. Yeah, we're going to come back. Um, I, Honey, I'm I going to the friend that store. That I'm not shopping. Is- I'm, I'm at the friend store. <laughs> They've friend got a sale on friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sorry. Keep going, keep going. <laughs> I do think people- Think about that. If they're highly motivated people with their careers, they're often like focused really hard, often at the cost of of losing relationships across their lifespan. And they think, but this is what's most important. It's right in front of me. Money is driving me because I want to make sure I get the promotion or the thing. And so at the cost of losing all the other stuff and what you're actually doing is you're you're setting yourself up for a shorter life probably because you don't have the thing, the real stuff that matters in your life isn't, again, what's in your bank account, assuming you have enough. It's who you're sharing your day with and how you're spending your time. And you don't do that once you retire. This has to be something that's cultivated across your life course. You learn how to make friends when you're kids, and you're supposed to use those skills to continue to develop meaningful connections with others across your life. And, and those things become more and more important as you get older. And, and this is the litmus test I often give people. And I'm, I haven't taught undergraduates in a while. Ooh, but I used to I say- I want to hear this. Wait, 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 this is a litmus test for what? For if you have good social health. Ooh, yep. Okay, let's hear it. So here's, here's the thing. If you were to have a terrible emergency in the middle of the night, do you have at least two different people you could call who would drop everything and come help you, who are not your spouse and don't live with you? And if you have at least two people that would drop everything and help you, most of the time you have a sufficient number of people in your life um, for to support meaningful social health. Now, what if everyone's phone is? What if phones are on silent? I know this is a big problem. It's a, it's a theory of do you have two people, but I, I mean, the actual practicality okay, know, of getting know, them show up. Theoretically. Yeah, you're going to have to like have them on, <laughs> find friends and make their phone buzz or something. I don't know. SOS. Yeah, SOS. 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 Uh, hold on. Does does, uh, does other family count? No. Or I would you, usually you, t- say I want you to not think about other family, but that's that's cultural to be fair, because in certain cultures, you really focus primarily on family. And this is true for especially Hispanic, um, a lot of Hispanic cultures where they're they're really large, robust families, and that is their social connection. And it it is very effective. Um, I would just say a Mm -hmm. lot of other cultures have not cultivated that kind of intense family 
relationship bond that they have. And so I usually say just to be on the safe side, let's think about non-family because that's what you should be paying. And it's yeah. not to be like, go to the friend store and make sure you bring two home. It's that you're cultivating trust and vulnerability with other humans on a regular basis. And those things can go away in a heartbeat. So you can't, it's like not yeah. watering. I got a plant in my office and I'm looking at it and it's, it's reminding me I have dead leaves over here. I forgot to water my plant last week. You do the same thing with your friends. If, if you don't, don't go away. The point about non-family is they have just like a volunteer job, the choice to walk away at any given time. And so you have these mm -hmm. regular engagements that you're, you're feeding and you're helping nurture over time. And those you keep with you over time. You can't just go get them. It's it's almost a certain um, there's a, a different value set that a, a non family friend brings because it does take a little it just takes a little bit more effort whereas a your brother should be there for you like forever you would assume even if you don't if my brother's listening just <laughs> I'm saying like if I don't call right. for like a whole month like you're still supposed to be there yeah there's a, we, there's a word for it. it's uh, filial responsibility this is sometimes what they use so if you have if you're family and you're related, you can not very much care for a family member, but still feel obligated to help be there for them when things matter. Friends, you can have a yeah. deep connection and have a falling out and not talk to them again. They have the choice to walk away. And there's something powerful about that, actually, because in order to nurture those meaningful connections, again, it's time, the investment of time and, and meaningful conversation so much so that you feel that you someone is going to give you grace if you screw up. And we only give people yeah. grace when they screw up, when we have enough trust and time under our belts to say, that was just a moment in time. Mm -hmm. So, okay. the But but it's a harder thing to solve for, though, I guess, where, you know, and I, I think of, I, I think of uh, as we age in America, and then I, oh, it was... This year, it's a popular headline that this the peak year for 65 year olds turning like 11,250 a mm -hmm. day. But like five years ago, it was 10,000 baby boomers turning 65 a day. So today, I always think of that group as uh, there's five, there's 10,000 people a day turning 70 right now because they were turning 65 five years ago. So you've got this aging population and you, you run into. And I've certainly I've seen that this is the reality of life is that as you get up in age, you do tend, you, people die, right? Your friends Thank die God. or they get sick or they mm -hmm. move away. And it may I think it's harder for the 75 year old, the 85 year old to maintain that just just because of the practicality of our, our of our lifespans. To some extent, that's this this constant. You almost have to always be cultivating uh -huh. you do. friends in case somebody gets divorced and moves away. I, I remember a period of time. I remember after college, you, 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 everyone's always heard all your life that 50 percent of all people get divorced. I remember thinking like 10 years after college, like, hey, wait, I don't know anybody that's gotten divorced. I know a lot of people get married. And then all of a sudden. Uh, maybe it was like 12 years later, 13, I don't know what year it was. Then all of a sudden it was like, oh, wait a minute. Okay. I see now. Let, now lots of people are getting divorced. But in that divorce, I remember one year, two of my best friends got divorced and they moved and it's like, wait a minute. Like that, like they, people, you, even your great friends don't necessarily stick around. They don't. Yeah. We have sort of seasons of our lives and different kinds of people come and go. And sometimes that's because they, you mutually benefit. You know, when you have kids, you need people who can pick up your kids. And there's like, there's sort of an exchange thing going on. And the true friendships don't require exchange, but sometimes they're built foundationally on those exchanges. Cause you're like, we both have skin in the game on this thing. And we're going to, we're going to mm -hmm. build from that. And then we, even when the, the skin in the game sort of is no longer a factor, does that relationship hold? And there's something to be said for having relationships that aren't the deep, deep, deep ones, but plenty that are very functional relationships because we need others in our lives. And the, the, the part that people often miss, I think, is that asking for help builds connection. It doesn't create a burden on others. And we often think, I'm not going to ask for help because I'm strong and I'm independent. And I will just say, that's BS. 
And in fact, we don't live in a world where we should ever be thinking about independence. We should be thinking about interdependence within social relationships with others. And if we aren't, you'll probably be lonely for a good bit of your life. And that's not going to be good for you. Okay. Do you have a particular, so let's say you're, somebody's listening right now and they, they are that hard charger. Yeah. And I, and I particularly see this with entrepreneurs. It's, it's executives, entrepreneurs that are just like, they're totally consumed with work and they do to some extent, they have this excuse that they're kind of always working. And I think maybe more so why they can, they can get uh, limited socially is that they're always thinking about work. So it's hard for them to even like go outside of that. It's like, uh, they can't relate at some point because they're so involved. Do you, is there, and maybe this is why this doesn't get as much fodder or press, but is there a, is there a Dr. Dawn Carr prescription around that? Around relationships. To make, to sure, make sure that you're healthy socially. Yeah. yeah. I, I do think that, um, I mean, I'm going to have to start coming. I need a, I need a Dr. Dawn Carr recommendation list. I think that's what you're telling me. Um, yeah, I, I, I would say, and this is just me think, but by, by the yeah. way, Dawn, just so you know, this is how this, that, that happens yeah. for you. The more of this kind of stuff you do, <laughs> the more podcasts I do as an interviewer, the more essentially the more shit you get consolidated <laughs> on a, on a piece of paper that becomes an article and like, yeah, you're right. Yeah. You do need your list, yeah, but yeah. keep going. I, I would say that if you're not doing something in person, with another person who you're not related to and is required to spend time with you at least once a week, it's insufficient. You're, you're going to lose. That's good, right? That's a that's, bare minimum. That needs to be on your, your, that's on your RX list. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are like, well, yeah, I have all these friends at work, but this is the problem. And you were asking about gender differences earlier. We're socialized as you know, in, in based on gender and, and these things are changing over time. But the men who are in that however many thousand a day turning 65 group, they were brought up at a time where men were supposed to be providers. And that was what made them valuable to their families and to society. And that there's no space in that definition for being a good friend to others. They might have those things, but they have to say priority one is providing. And so if providing for them meant I have to cut off my social relationships. They might reach retirement, stop working and feel like they're not important in the world anymore because the thing that made them important and valuable is gone. And that's terrible. Provided. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Women on the other hand have traditionally been raised where work, even if it became a part of their life was not front and center always. Right? They were socialized, especially, again, the 65-plus group, to focus on family, community, and um, being, being a good member of their, um, within their household of helping keep everybody up and going. So even if they were working as many hours as their spouse, women have, especially in this cohort, done all these other things. And although that was hard at the time when they're working, when they reach retirement, it's one of many roles that they're losing. So they still have a whole bunch left behind that help them have a sense of connection and meaning. And, and they have social relationships embedded in those social roles. So they're more protected socially. They're more practiced at flexing those social skills on a regular basis than men have been traditionally. So I would say we're, we've, we kind of did it wrong in the way that we set men up for retirement because of that. Um, so I think, I think new generations are better. But okay, so you're saying the the boomers, it is a little on average, it's it's harder for men. I think so. To keep yeah. a, a healthier social network, whereas the millennials, who, maybe not so much, or Gen X, maybe not so well, much. Well, you could think about that in that men and women are equally bad off. Uh, I think there's a lot of evidence saying that that the younger generations were hit hardest um, by the pandemic. They were the most lonely because they they spend so much time online. They didn't have a lot of people that they practice spending time in person with. And I do see that as being key. I think there's a lot that can be done with online connections and virtual lives. And there's a lot of value with socially connecting. I mean, we're doing it right now. We're talking online. There's a lot that can happen there. 
it's it's important, but it's not a replacement for in person engagement. The the physiological yeah. response you get from being in a physical space with another person is really powerful, and it's it requires you to be vulnerable in a different way than you can be um, if you're on the phone or if, if you're on a computer. You have all these unspoken things that people are reading about you, how you walk, how you stand, how your eyes are moving when you're communicating, how you're breathing. We pick up on these small cues and that's what builds this connection to another person is you're in this shared space, sharing this moment together and that's building trust and and you're able to be vulnerable and build connection. And and this is what I'm talking about. I think it's really um, something we don't prioritize nearly enough. And for those of you who do spend most of your time in a remote job, um, you love the grocery store for that exact reason. Mm, that is, I love the grocery store either way. <laughs> uh, my I, husband is a no matter what. My husband works remotely, and he's always like, "Ooh, ooh, ooh." What can I get at the grocery store for you? And he's like, I just need to be yeah. around people today because I haven't, I've been online all day. And I, I think there is something to that. And retirement is pretty much like that 24, 24 hours a day. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's part of the reason, the reason we like to go, um, go out in, in person and, and at least have these more peripheral connections with others. They matter too. We're, uh, online friends don't count as much. Work friends, you, you, I don't know if you finished that. Work friends don't, count as they don't count or they might go away when you stop working. Yeah. So work friends are great, but they are a different kind of relationship. If they're only friends at work, it makes work great, but it's still a work related Mm -hmm. social engagement. Right. I think if you bring your work friends home, that's different than their friends. Um, And I think we have to be really clear about that. You benefit socially from that being in work environments that you feel socially embedded in and you think you matter and you're doing something with other people. That's great. Um, But yeah, we have to be thinking about friends as just as important as everything else. And in fact, I would argue it's more important. You know, if we're, if we're really investing in our lives and our futures, I hope you're, you're thinking about, you know, we don't raise our kids so that at 18 they can walk away and we never see them again. We're hoping that we're raising them to have a relationship with us that will extend throughout their adult lives as long as we're lucky to have them. I mean, I hope that's why people, what people are trying to do. I think we should be thinking about friendships in a similar way, where we're helping cultivate those long-term memories and connections to our history. Um, but as you get older, you you do lose friends, and that's really tough. So, um, you know, you had mentioned you're in your 80s, and a lot of your friends might die. Um, and you don't have very many left. So here's my advice about that. Make friends who are of all ages. Yes. And, and that's important. In, inter- intergenerational. Absolutely. Yeah. We should be we should be learning. I learn more from my graduate students um, about all kinds of things. And I love being around them because they remind me of what I, where my blind spots are. And we should never assume that we know it all just because we're old. We're older than we used to be. There's so many exciting things to learn about in the world, and we should be curious about other people who are very different from us. And that's a really exciting part of aging as well. Being surrounded by people who are different ages gives us more variability and more kinds of environments to be exposed to. I feel like I need to get some younger friends. I think my... Well, you're a work friend, Mallory. You don't count. (laughs) The... uh... Um, my producer, Mallory. Actually, no, it does count. We've seen each other out, outside of work. I, was it your writing rehearsal? Yeah, of course. So let's get a little more practical just for a second here. Roles. The, yeah, I was, I'm thinking this like Venn diagram of you. I love your Venn diagram of money, people, exercise, roles. Uh, corpus, cor- these hobbies on steroids. I, I've gotten the question. I got the question enough, Dawn, that I, we made this core pursuit finder. So I surveyed a bunch of happy retirees and found the top 120 activities that, that they are passionate about for anywhere from woodworking to tennis. Right. But by the way, which is the, yeah. And you've heard of the tennis study from the Norway yeah. on longevity in tennis. Like it adds 9.7 years to your life. Cause it kind of does all your, it, it checks every one of your boxes. A, it doesn't cost any, barely costs any money. You have to do it with like at least three other people it is exercise, and I guess it's a role yeah, too. Yeah, it gives you it gives you something to work towards. Yeah, I, I'm all about it. I think it's it, 
Shots so, okay, so so let's go. What about finding and cultivating these? Like, do you, do you have any prescription for that? I also think you don't usually retire and suddenly figure out who you are, who you want to be when you grow up. I mean, we should be cultivating these things over time. And this means being opportunistic with exploring. Um, th this is, I mean, let's go back to having younger friends. You get to be exposed to things you didn't know um, were out there to do. But I think we need to be having hobbies. I, we, you, people say hobbies as though they're like things that don't matter sometimes, but they're they're part of figuring out the things that give us joy in our lives. And I think we so often decide that work is a is a an, a, an activity that is a worthy activity, and the rest of the stuff is just wasting time. But that's not yep, that's yep. not at all. I mean, there are plenty of cultures. If we were to require you to only work 20 hours a week from now on, and you could, you, had, you could work as hard as you wanted for 20 hours and use the rest of the time to do other things, people might invest differently in their lives, but they somehow think, I, I have a free pass to decide this one activity I can figure out how to be good at, and then everything else doesn't matter. And, and we miss out on life when we set those things down. So they, they, they're like, oh, the two weeks I get a vacation, I'm going to cram in some things. But there's never the ability to sort of habitually figure out what things kind of work well for us. Uh, and we have to actually make space in our schedule for those things. Maybe we're making space for people, but we also need to be making space for activities. I, I feel like you got you to gotta invest in those things over time to really figure out what's, what's worth it. This is, this is a cool concept. Uh, this uh, this guy, I think was uh, I think his kid was his daughter was learning to play chess, and he was thinking, "Wait a minute, maybe I should learn to play chess." And and he thought, "We don't keep learning as we get older." So he took a year to begin like twelve different things that he had never done, like singing and surfing and chess and juggling. He learned how to juggle, um, and I thought it was just an interesting way to think about it because. We do tend to, by the time we're 60, it's like, oh, I know I'm good at this kind of stuff and I'm terrible at this kind of stuff and I like these things. I don't. So I'm, I'm, I get I get more narrow-minded about yeah. it. And We're afraid of failure. What do you say about this? Oh, it's this? amazing. I love that. I love, yeah, I've heard him speak. It's such a great concept and I, I think it was such a great inspiration. My husband started taking piano lessons two years ago. He was in a rock band when he was younger but never learned to read music. And we got this beautiful grand piano where kids play piano. He's listening to them play. And he's like, well, I want to use this cool machine. So he's in his 50s. And he's like, I'm going to start taking piano lessons. And he's been taking piano lessons for two years. And he's like working on, you know, the boring stuff. And then working on like, it's the coolest thing ever. Because he has to be comfortable with failure on a regular basis. And we're just, we get really bad at that. We're so comfortable in our safe zones that we're afraid to try things out that we might actually ultimately end up like, but learning to do new things, taking on hard stuff and learning to fail and learn those skills um, from failure, they're incredibly powerful. But if you're trying to refine what kinds of things are exciting in your life and what to fill your, your time with, um, yeah. Like this could be a trial and error. This could be a really good strategy to say, okay, I'm going to do 12 new things this year and I'm going to make a list and I'm going to let myself be okay with failure on each of these things. I, I kind of love that. 12, 12 sounds like a lot. I, well, would, I, I was going to say one new thing You talked year. about 12 things I, in this. Yes, I agree. But you could try, I mean, it depends on what you're trying to do. I'm not going to say big things like learn how to play the piano, but you know, there could be... I don't think that's that big of a thing. I think the piano is a... I think that's the perfect thing to learn. It's pretty awesome. Uh, if you look at the YouTube videos, you can learn piano in like six weeks, according to like musician. Yeah, I don't recommend that. The part of it is getting a good <laughs> teacher and having a human connection to learning new things. All of these... See, if you want to put all the ingredients in there, you have to have people, brain, movement. I mean, I like your, your kind of checklist of uh, kind of uh, curating the kinds of things that we go after. Yeah. By the way, you're hundred percent right. You need a, you need an actual piano teacher. I have one. Nice. Um, he's, he's like kind of half blind. Um, but, uh, he's just a really cool dude and it's amazing. He can't really see, but he is amazing at piano. I love that. And it's just the, the connection of it is, is so much better than a YouTube video. 
A couple just quick uh, tie up and the, just quick, almost like a lightning round opinion of, of work in uh, technically if you're in retirement. My opinion of work in retirement is that it's a wonderful thing. And uh, I think it's very much dependent on what you're doing and why you're doing it. But the autonomy to walk away um, and the autonomy to choose something that gives you joy and gives you a sense of meaning in some form or another, whether it's just being around people on a regular basis or solving problems or learning new things. I think post-retirement work is an, uh, something that benefits lots a of people. Thing. Yeah. How many close connections slash friends should you have at any given time? I think that we have different levels of friendships. We have acquaintances, we have friends that we would invite to a party, but not necessarily show, share all of our deepest secrets with. And we have these deep, very rigidly close friendships, I'll say that of the extreme, these super close friendships. I think the super close friendships, we need a minimum of two. I think the peripheral ones, we probably need a minimum of five. And the rest are your friends at the grocery store. We need those two. I just, yeah. Well, thank you. It was, uh, I love, I love, uh, you have a, you, you, you were able to be really prescriptive about some of these looser concepts like volunteering, friendship, socialization. They can kind of get away from us because it's, they're hard to wrangle. And I think it's important to be able to wrangle, uh, those the concepts that are, they're like a herd of sheep that easily disperse. And it's, I think it's helpful to to be able to wrangle them. And I think you do that in a, in a, a, a wonderful way. Well, so. I'll make sure to make my uh, Don Carr prescription list for uh, living a good post-retirement life. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be ready yeah, for the next time. I'll be waiting talk. for it.